So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Stephen Weiber. I'm manager for policy and advocacy at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And I'm very grateful for LIBA for hosting this webinar here today on ebook licensing and the vanishing library. I'm also extremely grateful to our speakers who I will be introducing shortly. And of course, to you for your attendance here today. Whether you are a veteran of discussions around ebooks, about the laws and practicalities of access to information through libraries, or just starting to learn about it. I'm really happy to say we have attendees from 51 different countries here today, which is a really good turnout. This webinar is taking place in English, but I'm aware this is not necessarily the first language for many of you, and so we'll all look to speak slowly and clearly. Je tiens notamment à souhaiter le bienvenu à nos participants francophones. As you will hear in the course of this webinar, the topic of e-books is very much a live one that's being debated and even litigated around the world at this very moment. So please do join in the debate on social media using the hashtags ebooksos, one word, and kr21, so hashtag kr21. And we'll put these up in the chat for you so that you can use them and really join that conversation. Although there are different claims out there as to when the ebook was invented, one story at least dates this back to just over 50 years ago on the 4th of July 1971. The first e-reader e itself dates back to the late 90s, and these have, and the e-books, of course, have increasingly come onto the horizon of libraries uh, since then. Yet, as we hear today, we're arguably still a very long way from realizing the potential of this half-century-old technology to fulfill its potential, to support the traditional missions of libraries in allowing everyone to fulfill their rights to education, to science, to culture, and to information. This goes as much for the trade ebook sector as for the scholarly, the, the ebook sector that really matters for academic libraries, for research as well, as we're here today. In short, despite all the time that's passed, the market for ebooks does not yet seem to have, a, have achieved a state of maturity similar to that for physical books, and so allow while allowing libraries to do their jobs. Call to action on ebooks are not new. In particular, in the public library sector, there have been efforts over many years to secure better terms. But with the COVID-19 pandemic making physical lending far more complicated, if not impossible, it has become essential for libraries to be able to provide access to books electronically. Due to quarantining rules in place on physical books, the closure of buildings and tough restrictions on travel, in effect, the ability of libraries to, of all sorts to fulfill their missions has become dependent on the prices and the terms of the license offered, licenses offered them. The goal must be to ensure that we use the lessons of the pandemic to affect change to policies and to practices that will allow libraries to do their jobs into the future. I'm just going to summarize the, I'm just going to summarize these first words quickly in French for our francophone audience as well. Donc je tenais à dire que la technologie de e-books existe depuis plus que 50 ans, on peut dire. Mais toutefois, malgré le temps passé, nous sommes toujours pas à une étape où le marché pour le livre électronique a une étape de maturité suffisante pour fonctionner tout en garantissant la capacité, la possibilité pour les bibliothèques de faire en sorte que leurs utilisateurs et leurs utilisatrices puissent, puissent profiter, puissent engager, puissent faire observer leurs droits à l'éducation, à la recherche, à la science, à la culture et à l'information. Malgré tout ce temps, nous sommes toujours dans une étape où, en effet, la capacité des bibliothèques de réaliser leur mission dépend du contenu de licence et pas de la, pas de la loi. Et donc, c'est donc pour cette raison-là que nous voulons vraiment, nous nous posons cette question, nous nous posons la question de qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour faire en sorte que nous avons un marché pour les livres électroniques qui respecte les possibilités pour les bibliothèques. This is an issue on which we'll be seeing plenty more work in future. Stichting IFLA Foundation is very happy to share the news that it has signed a contract with the Arcadia Foundation in order to carry out a three-year project to build capacity among libraries and related fields across Europe 
to engage in advocacy around copyright, including around ebooks. Arcadia is a charitable foundation of Lisbeth Housing and Peter Baldwin. It supports charities and scholarly institutions that preserve cultural heritage and the environment. Arcadia also supports projects that promote open access and all of its awards are granted on the condition that any materials produced are made available for free online. Since 2002, Arcadia has awarded more than $777 million to projects around the world. The work on ebooks, on knowledge rights, and uh, more broadly on Knowledge Rights 21, is the result of a process that's engaged different library organizations and individuals. Through this work, we hope that there will be a strong and lasting positive impact on the ability of our institutions to support education, research, and cultural participation to improve laws and practices across the continent. We plan, over the duration of the programme, to work with partners to ensure better conditions for library lending, legislative action around contract override and technological protection measures, stronger understanding of and support for open norms, and to promote both rights retention and secondary publishing rights. Those involved in the programme are working to finalise structures in order to be able to share further details about this work and its delivery shortly. With that, I now want to introduce our speakers. They will be Johanna Anderson, who is subject librarian at the University of Gloucestershire and founder of the eBook SOS campaign. So you have that hashtag there. Take a look at the eBook SOS campaign online. She will explain more. It's a fantastic example of library advocacy in action. We also have Chris Freeland, who is Director of Open Libraries at the Internet Archive, working in support of the organization's mission to provide universal access to all knowledge. Before joining the Internet Archive, Chris was an Associate University Librarian at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, managing the University Library's digital in in initiatives and related services. His research explores the intersections of science and technology in a cultural heritage context having published and presented on a variety of topics relating to the use of new media and emerging technologies in libraries and museums. Finally, we have Ben White, who is chair of the Copyright and Legal Working Group of the Ligue de Bibliothèque Européenne de Recherche, or European Research Libraries Association, LIBA, who is also a researcher at the Centre for Intellectual Property Policy and Management at the University of Bournemouth, and a library advocate extraordinaire. So, I will hand over to Joanna now, but as said, please do use those hashtags. Thank you, and over to you, Joanna. Hi, um, everybody. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thanks to Knowledge21 for inviting me uh, to speak at this webinar. I'm really sorry, but um, it, 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 it may be best for you, but... Um, my web camera isn't working on this platform at the moment, so we've had to disable it. So you, I even brushed my hair for this event. So, <laughs> so you're missing that. Um, but um, so I'll be kind of you'll just hear my voice through the ether. Um, in case any of you don't know who I am, um, that's me, uh, and I have uh, been campaigning for an investigation into uh, the academic ebook market in the UK for the past year. And um, I'm going to talk to you about how the pandemic has created a the perfect storm for publishers to profiteer from um, ebooks. I'm going to talk about a little, about, a little bit about who we are behind the campaign and provide a bit of context because before, I mean, ebooks have been an issue since before uh, COVID and access to them for libraries um, and talk a little bit about what happened during COVID and um, a bit of evidence of some of the challenges that we're facing and then talk about how the campaign took on some of these challenges and um, the next steps that we hope to take. So and we have a website academicebookinvestigation.org if you've not signed to the open letter um, please please um do so uh, if you're in the uk uh if you are in you know in, not in the uk you're outside the uk um the letter was the intention of the letter was that it could be adapted and used um in other 
in other in other countries. So if you wanted to use the content of that and adapt it for yourselves and use it for your for similar purposes, um, please do. Uh, because this is a global problem. Sorry, I've just got a bit distracted by some people having sound issues, but I can, hope most of you can hear me. Um, this has been recorded, so you'll be able to watch it back at least. Um, so uh, just just really briefly, I, I, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long because I've got a lot of content to to, to cover. But um, the, the the three key people behind ebook SOS is is me, Caroline Ball, subject librarian at um, Derby University. Rachel Bickley, who's a senior academic liaison librarian at London Met. And we've had um, Kathleen McCauley, in, who's a university librarian at Maynooth University and is also the president of the Library Association of Ireland, who has been championing, championing the cause and raising the issue in Ireland. Um, we've had a lot of other people supporting us, but we're the people that have been kind of leading the campaign. Um, so the context, pre-COVID, there were uh, lots of rumblings about the difficulties of us being able to purchase ebooks, and um, only 10%, this study was done in 2018, uh, that found that only 10% of academic titles are available to universities in electronic format. Um, that may have changed a lot now, you would have thought um, it, that would have increased, uh, it's the way that you would have expected it to go with the uh, with publishers keeping up with the times, but um, I suspect all the, a lot of the new restrictions and money making has, has probably kept that figure about the same. Um, so, uh, so some of the publishers are it is their policy explicitly to not make ebooks available because it cannibalizes their sales. Um, Sage since pointed out to me that they do make ebooks available, but they only make them available if you sign up to their individual bundles and. And, and platforms, which I'll talk a bit, a little bit in a moment. So it's not quite as simple as as as, as you think. Uh, so just an example. I, I know some of you will have seen this before, but this is a reading list that I've been working with at the University of Gloucestershire, and it's a new course that we were launching. And this is really what what started me campaigning because I was just so frustrated that I could not access. That, I mean, there were so few ebooks available, and when they were available, they were either horrendously expensive compared to the print copy, or they had very restricted licensing. So, um, so here there's books that were thirty pounds in hard copy, and then if if you were to buy an ebook copy, two hundred pounds upwards for a single user license, um, which, I mean, small libraries like ours, that's just not an option, um. And this is the second page of the reading list. You know, you've got ebooks that are single user licenses that are four hundred and eighty one thousand pounds. And so it was very difficult for me to provide access to these books. Um, conditions got a bit squallier. So from January 2020, librarians started noticing that ebook prices rocketed or were removed from individual sale to libraries. And, and librarians took to Twitter to um, share the problems that they were having. There's some screenshots of some bits and pieces that I posted where books were previously were £35 and they'd gone up to seven, £744, the ebook that is, for a single user licence. Um, or books that had been previously available for sale were, were withdrawn. Um, at least three well-known academic publishers raised the cost for a single user ebook by 200% or more with no warning. Uh, these are just more examples in these in these screenshots here that other people started contributing. So, you know, the, this particular one, um, £3,696. There's no rhyme or reason. Uh, so as COVID, COVID started uh, to, to have an impact and lockdowns started to be applied, uh, access to the electronic, to electronic learning materials became vital. That was in March 2020, as I'm sure any of you that work in libraries will have experienced there was not the option to use the hard copy books that we would have done um, previously. So uh, many of us librarians were sitting at home, working from home, desperately trying to find access to electronic resources that our students could use. 
and and it, it it was it was extremely challenging. So, how did publishers react to this situation? Well, there was some great fanfare from them about uh, making free um, ebook access available to students, as well as upgrading um, licenses to libraries. And whilst we were very grateful for that, that lasted for a very short period of time, which these publishers don't, you know, they don't share that. So as far as the outside world is concerned, we've got this these lovely free packages. But um, in reality, that stopped kind of mid pandemic, if not sooner. And this was a global issue. So I've, I've um, quoted Carl here from the Harvard Library Office for Scholarly Communication, who stated the summer of free where many publishers gave access has turned into outright non-sales or pricing that's so exorbitant there is no way libraries can pay, can pay. and we're all finding that so I would argue that they um, anticipated the, the 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 situation and the reliance we would have on e-textbooks and um, rather than this altruistic show that they made at the beginning of the COVID, the COVID pandemic, I would argue that that was really at the heart of it, market manipulation and profiteering. Uh, so um, we, I I contacted JISC with lots of examples. Um, JISC are kind of a, a middle organisation that work, that, that work with uh, ebook publishers and providers and university librarians to secure deals. Um, they do a lot of other things, but that's one of the things they do. Um, and I didn't get anywhere with them um, in terms of lobbying the publishers. And we, we kind of like hit, hit a bit of a brick wall. I mean, trying to get any leadership in the profession on this matter. So librarians took to Twitter and were sharing examples of, of ebook pricing and um, a spreadsheet was started to so that librarians could crowdsource examples of the challenges faced. I can provide um, links and, and all the resources to this uh, with the slides with the slides later on. But um, the spreadsheet was started to facilitate an anonymity because you know, publishers are, especially uh, you guys in the States will be aware, um, publishers are, are notoriously litigious and also in, in, across Europe you found that. But um, and, and a lot of people were quite worried about sharing information because of gagging clauses that publishers put into their agreements. So um, there was a lot of documentation shared there and figures shared there and comments and it's appalling it really is there's a it's a really stark picture and I was talking to several uh, uh, journalists on the matter and they they came back to me and said to me is th is this data real they just they couldn't believe the, the prices we've been asked for um I've just put some screenshots here of some examples some more examples and the percentage of the increases um you can see that for yourselves. I won't read them out to you, but I think we can all agree it's pretty staggering. Um, so the evidence that we were collected that we were collecting um, had, had similar themes. So we were all discovering that content was disappearing from sale, as I've discussed already, and appearing on sometimes appearing on other site other suppliers' databases where. Um, the prices have gone right up or we were being told that you couldn't buy them in there was no sales rights in your region um it, it, it was yeah it, it, i mean it was it was total disarray um there was were increasingly restrictive and confusing licenses and bundled packages so um there were publishers that had stopped selling uh rolling licenses to ebooks so for those of you that you, that you of you that don't know um ebooks are licensed to us we we don't own them um and so if a publisher decides to withdraw them or uh ask for more money for them often they can yeah so we don't actually own them um and permanent licenses were, were relatively common um, we would sometimes lose them, as uh, any of you that know about Dawson Era, who was an ebook supplier that went um, that collapsed um, recently. A lot of their ebook provision um, was lost uh, because because they were no more. But and we tend to have them on on 
rolling licenses but that increasingly increasingly stopped being the case and we were being asked to buy licenses for ebooks that would expire after 12 months so there's an example of one on here where um, a library was being asked to pay over five thousand pounds for an individual annual license for an ebook that was 20 pounds in hard copy um so it was getting increasingly difficult to find access to books and they were the very basic key reading lists that that we all needed to use and i don't know of many libraries that can afford this this kind of money um books were increasingly being put onto bundle packages so quite a lot of um oxford university press books you can't buy unless you sign up to oxford university press packages um and they were doing deals with cortex and various bundled third party providers like that um which which made things increasingly difficult for us um, so speaking of Oxford University Press, I mean, this is because of the subject matter I look after in my job. They're, the, they're one of the publishers, them, Taylor and Francis and Routledge, are, are two of the publishers that I've had the most problems with, although there are a lot that are, are quite difficult. Um, and this is the reading list I showed you at the beginning. Um, at the end of me trying to work through this reading list and after a lot of negotiation with o Oxford University Press, um, the result was that the library was blocked from purchasing these books and the school had to buy these books themselves and um, based on student numbers and um, via an annual subscription. So the library can't perform its duty in making books available to anybody who might like to read them. Um, yeah, so I, I, I still don't have those books available for, for the students, which makes it quite difficult if you've got cross disciplinary subjects. Um, where students might want to use books that have been subscribed for other um, prescribed for other courses. Um, huge price rises. We've already we've already discussed that. Um, they didn't stop at the beginning of of COVID. They are increasingly going up. So they're still going up despite all of our campaigning. Um, books have been going up. For, so the top example that went up from £359 for a single user licence, which I would argue is still ridiculously expensive, to £739.20 in one week, in the space of one week, no rhyme or reason. Um, and there is also no transparency. So Sage is, a, is an example of this, where they ask you librarians to, um, it's a price on application, situation where it's done on a case-by-case -case basis and the librarian has to provide the ISBN of the book, the course it's required for, the institution, how many students are estimated to use it and the contact details. Now that is front-loading the cost onto libraries. Um, it's very difficult to guess or establish how many times a book might be used and we wouldn't buy hard copies on that basis. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. And often in, in higher education, we don't know the final number of students um, when we're trying to buy these books because it's quite a long process in the in the university application and clearance processes and students deciding on where they want to go. Um, we won't know for quite some time, often until the course starts or, or even maybe sometimes a week after the course starts as to how many students are, are on that on that course. Um, academics change their reading lists. Um, they update update them as they go along. They're kind of live things that they, they, you know they're not stagnant, so it makes it really difficult. Um, so what did we do? We we tried to harness the storm and um, use this data and the outrage to try to bring about change. And um, we 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 penned a open letter to as I mentioned before, and when I when I introduced this session um for people to sign and to send to the government the uk government in order to um ask them to carry out an investigation into the into academic publishing and we received a little bit of criticism that within this letter we hadn't suggested solutions we hadn't said what we thought should happen um 
And our argument for that, I think, is 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 a very strong one in that we don't have access to all the data that is needed because of gagging clauses. We don't have the power um, to scrutinise publishers the same way that, that politicians or competition authorities do. And we also didn't want to preempt any outcome of a full and open and honest investigation. We also didn't want to suggest solutions because that would distract um, from a lot of the topics at hand and it would allow the publishers to hone in on those possible solutions and um, distract everybody by pulling them apart and telling us why they won't work instead of everybody trying to come up with with, with solutions together. So, um, you know, senior people in, in, in libraries, as Stephen was saying at the beginning, ebooks have been an issue for quite a long time and if all of the sector leaders haven't been able to address this problem and JISC hasn't been able to address this problem then I don't know how three subject librarians who are doing this on top of a day job um, frustrated because they can't get the books that they need are expected to provide the solutions we just we just want to be able to buy books for our students in an affordable manner in a way that we've got some control over our collections um, four and a half thousand people sector wide assigned the letter. We've got a lot of support from um, some of the of the major organisations. So SILIP, the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals, um, UK, UK Libraries, Archives and Copyright Alliance, um, Library Association of Ireland, Welsh Higher Education Libraries Forum, National Students Union and um, several of the acquisition groups and purchasing groups and consortiums. Um, which was brilliant, and um, Society of Legal Scholars, among others. So um, that ha that has been really, really encouraging. And we'd really like more to get on board, if possible. Sorry, my slides seem to take a little while to upload. OK, so um, the campaign got a lot of traction. We got coverage in The Guardian, a national newspaper here in the UK. Um, the BBC business covered it, which was a big, a big thing. Um, it was in Times Higher, which is the higher education um, newspaper in the UK. One Kate and um, IFLA uh, covered it as well. We also trended on Reddit. Um, which was which was a, a big news for us, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of comments on the on the story. And I might add that most of them came from the US and were students complaining about the price of textbooks and and the, their inability to access textbooks. So um, you know, it's just more evidence that it is a global problem. Um, so um, I've pinched this slide from Cathal's uh, presentation to UKSG. I hope he doesn't mind. But um, while we were doing while we were doing the campaign in the UK, Ireland also um, wrote a, a call for action, and which was signed by four key representative groups. And um, I've been doing a lot of work on trying to to get this this matter raised with the with the relevant authorities. And they found very similar issues to us. So unsustainable ebook pricing, um, books being 20 times more expensive than the print equ equivalents. And um, that the largest international publishers had the highest price multipliers. Um, excuse me, I skipped a slide there. Um, so the publishers' responses to us were that um, librarians <coughs> who were complaining about the situation were um, comparing apples to pears. So they were saying that you can't compare individual print costs to a digital license um, because it doesn't represent the reality of how the different formats are used. Um, they also said that uh, digital textbooks are put together using multiple authors over a long period and is regularly updated and has additional functionality um, and might be used by an entire cohort of students. This was the Publishers Association that commented this. They've since declined to repeat this elsewhere, I think, because they did get quite a bit of criticism. And the fact that um, most of us know that, that e -book, digital textbooks aren't regularly updated. Um, they rarely have additional functionality. They tend to be the a PDF copy, often of poor quality, of the original textbook. So, and in many ways, they're less accessible than um, our, our hard copy books. 
So, um, as you can imagine, librarians were quite angry about these responses because they're just not accurate. And um, some of these responses were responses I'd already had from Taylor and Francis and Oxford University Press and, and, and all of these organisations. And when I first approached them with my complaints and so we've been going round and round in circles having this conversation um and nobody's listening so you know it was it was just more of the same and um so i i've i've been promoting this this blog post a lot um but if you haven't read it yet i'd encourage you to go and read it so anthony sinnott um at york university um wrote a blog post in response to the publishers and it's very 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 good it's very well written um stating why their their excuses were problematic and um the thing that stood out most for me is is where he said that the, these complaints are coming from experienced and knowledgeable profession professionals who have an intimate understanding of the complexities and require more meaningful engagement than empty platitudes and condescending manner that does not indicate a desire for meaningful discussion and I think this desire for meaningful discussion factor is a key thing and um, that's partly why we didn't want to um, we took we took this matter to um, the government and the competition and markets authority because sitting down in a room and having nice chats with publishers worked it's just not working and they don't seem to be showing any signs of having any kind of meaningful discussion with us or acting um on some of these challenges that we're putting to them i think they just feel like they're untouchable so they can behave how they want so um what do we do next the you know i forget about the storm i think we need to whip up a tornado and, and keep going it's going to be a long road we none of us thought that, the, that changes would happen instantly we've got to keep pushing on this and i think the publishers thought we'd be quiet and go away um and we, it would fizzle out but it, it, when we come up to september when the academic year is starting again um a lot of the uh packages that libraries signed up to during covid to give them access to urgent access to ebooks they're going to expire and publishers are going to ramp those prices right up um uh, universities risk having big gaps in their collection and and big gaps in their finances with nothing to show for it um so this is this will be an ongoing problem we need to keep fighting so the education select committee replied saying to our letter saying that, that whilst they were aware of the situation they didn't have the capacity to help us because they had a lot on their complaint and it, on their plates and in their portfolios um, which was a bit disappointing but at least we'd raised the issue with them and we were determined that we we'd continue to keep doing so and um, all of the government departments in the UK that might have been responsible um, were saying you know it wasn't their responsibility nobody knows who deals with ebooks so it could be um in the department of media and culture it could be in the department of education you know it, 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 business um it falls under lots of different categories and nobody wanted to take responsibility for it um we found out also afterwards that the higher education minister had been pu had been lobbied by the publishers association the same one who'd commented on the ebooks um, being extra whizzy, super functional, amazing things that we should be spending lots of money on. And um, very disappointingly for us, she seemed to take note of what they said and not what we said. And her response to our letter was um, bizarre in that it um, stated how much support she'd given the publishing industry or the government had given the publishing industry and just seemed to completely dismiss any of our concerns. That has changed a bit and um, we have had one of her policy advisors contacting us and we have explained the issues. I think that's mainly because the pressure has continued and, and MPs, a lot of our supporters have got their MPs, they're member of parliament, so they're representative in, in parliament um, asking questions and you know vice chancellors have got on board and all this kind of stuff so i think it's a problem that's not going away and she's had to answer to it so there is there is there are some rumblings going on there and we also have a big problem that um so i mentioned one kche before and it is a it's a blog work that claims to be the home of higher education policy which brings the sector together through expert analysis debate and insight and they're very influential 
Um, they are listened to by policy advisors in government and, and sector leaders and, and this, that and the other. So they, they, they are taken notice of. And um, what we found out in the last year is that they've got they, they seem to have some partnership with e, e, with Cortex, which is one of the most powerful third party um, e textbook bundlers who are everywhere I mean if you're a librarian in the UK it's, <laughs> oh, it's impossible to uh, not see Cortex you know they just seem to be getting their fingers everywhere and so a lot of the content that 1KHE was publishing um, was published in association with Cortex a lot of the events they were holding were sponsored by Cortex and that made it really difficult um when you see that the power and influence some of these publishers have on 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 the big organizations so yeah that's a that's a very difficult challenge um so how do we get to uh you know past this this um perfect storm that we're in and 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 through to the other side we have asked the competition and markets authority which is a body, um, independent body in the um, UK that can investigate and intervene. They do have quite a lot of power. Um, but as you can imagine, they also have a lot of on their plate. They've got a lot of complaints going to them and they've only got a certain amount of resources. So and we've been in conversation with them in um, how we might go about um, raising the profile and getting an investigation into this. And they have been very very generous with their time and they have listened to us and they meet with us regularly and give us updates um it is a they have said to us though that it's it's a long road and we're not going to get immediate answers so all we can do is keep pushing and lobbying and getting and increasing the calls for um the competition and markets authority to to investigate so um uh, anybody anybody who's uh, friends with any um lords in parliament or i don't know any anybody with particular power who you think might be interested in supporting us um please do get in touch with us and let us know because the more people that write to the competition and markets authority the better chance we'll have and some of the bigger organizations sector leaders in the uk like jisc and rl uk so that's research libraries uk and scon have been very reluctant to publicly support us because they don't want to upset the publishers um, and we really need support like that in order to get the Competition and Markets Authority to listen. So um, we need to keep pushing for that. As I said, we've had discussions with the Department of Education and policy advisors. And there's, as I said, there's things going on there. Um, again, it, bureaucracy it moves very slowly. We have to um, keep up the pressure. Um, and we also are looking at collaborative working across higher education, across the sector, because this is a massive problem in national health service libraries um, in the UK. And I'm really sorry, um, because I'm very conscious that I do harp on about academic libraries, but that's that's where I work. So that's what I know about. But I'm very conscious that things are a whole lot worse for our national health service libraries. Um, they're really, really screwed over in terms of the pricing of ebooks and e-resources and with very little kind of oversight um, into that and um, further education libraries have got a lot of different um you know have got a lot less funding than we do public libraries and um, that's a whole different kind of set of challenges and um so so we need to really work cross sector which is great knowledge 21 i think it is is will help facilitate that um, and we have been working with um, uh, future libraries, and, library futures, sorry, <laughs> and um, Internet Archive and with, and Spark and all, all these different kinds of organisations to see if we can get some kind of international movement going. Um, I'm very, very conscious that this... Um, you, you know, this, this feels a bit ex exclusionary of... Um, non-english speaking countries or english speaking that's not their first language or countries in the global south so less developed countries and that is really difficult because we all face different different challenges but um, we're all suffering from a lack of this um, access to information so i know that there are a lot of people that have come internationally to this webinar if 
you want to get involved in the campaign or start something where you are, then um, please do get in touch and we'll see what we can do. Um, even if it's kind of helping you with statements or, or you know, a group um, statement that we can all sign or something like that, then then um, the, the door is always open. If you've got any ideas, then then let us know. Um, that said, we are. I'm. I'm. I'm going quite far over my time, so I'm going to be quite quick. But um, w that said, just an appeal. We are all subject librarians. We're doing this in our own time and with a lot of pressure on us. So there's only so much we can do, but we'll help where we can, or pass you on to people that might be able to help more than we can. Um, so and librarians, we're pushing for librarians to engage more critically in their collection development, and um, because. Restricting access to these educational resources impacts on educational freedoms. Um, it, it, it impacts on on the budgets. What are the ethics of us spending five hundred pounds on one user ebook? Um, it's not a responsible way of spending money, and we need to be more critical of that. And um, we've also been working to advocate ethical publishing options to academics and authors. And um, some of our fantastic supporters did put together a document, which you can find on our website, which um, encourages academics to and potential authors to think about um, certain things before they accept a publishing deal and the key things they need to be asking publishers at the very least if publishers know that authors are aware of these issues um then it, it puts the pressure on them a little bit more so um and it's been a very well received document um people have found it very very helpful because the world of ebooks and electronic resources are very complicated um so they don't necessarily understand um the context um, and I'm finishing now. Sorry for overrunning. So um, if we fail to persist with this and fight our corner, then we fail to fulfill our basic function, which I think that um, Ben is going to cover later on when he's talking and um, Chris is as well. We'll fail to provide fair, swift and economical and effective access to information for users, um, which is what we're all about. So, yeah, so that's me. Um, there are several ways that you can contact me, join the conversation on Twitter, sign our letter. Um, we've got an email address. We've got a GISC mailing list as well. You can sign up to where people share ideas. Um, it's gone a little bit quiet at the moment, but I guess it's the time of year. We're all really busy, but um, there's quite a lot of interesting conversation that happens there. And um, that's me done. Thank you all for listening. And if you've got any questions, let me know. Thank you very much, Johanna. That was fantastic. And thank you so much for setting out, firstly, the scale of the issue, just how dramatic some of those issues are, some of the, the, the challenges being faced, the huge impact and, and, uh, and the need and the progress that you've made so far on action. I think, as you said, the importance of giving access to information, ebooks, these are questions that are being faced around the world and there's so much potential for action and to bring together our actions. So, in fact, now we're going to go to another part of the world. We're going to go to Chris Freeland, who is Director of Open Libraries at the Internet Archive. And as we're running a little bit over time, I'm going to hand over to you straight away. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you. And uh, um, thanks, Johanna, for the uh, for the, the preamble here. And uh, thanks to Knowledge Rights 21 for the invitation to speak today. So a big good morning uh, from the United States. Um, my name is Chris Freeland, and I'm a librarian at the Internet Archive. So Johanna has described the issues around modern eBooks, and I'm gonna to talk today about controlled digital lending, which helps address another problem in the eBook marketplace, and that's the 20th century gap. So libraries have made massive investments in their print collections, but the vast majority of those 20th century works aren't available in electronic form, which as we all know is how our users, library users, are wanting to access content today. So what I'm going to uh, walk through today is I'm going to talk about how controlled digital lending works. And I'm also going to talk then about how the Internet Archive has implemented controlled digital lending with the Open Libraries program and how other libraries can take uh, can use our uh, our system, our service to help provide ebooks to your patrons. 
So controlled digital lending comes from both the copyright and the library communities. You know, what is now called controlled digital lending was originally envisioned by librarian and, and law professor Michelle Wu uh, when her law library in Houston, Texas, was destroyed by floods. And so the lending model was then described and named in a white paper by Kyle Courtney from Harvard and Dave Hansen from Duke University. And so at the Internet Archive, we've used controlled digital lending for uh, 10 years to make our physical collection available for borrowing online. And the way the controlled digital lending works is this. So for a book that's in a library's collection, the library can decide to lend either the physical book or a scanned version of that book, but not both at the same time. The library has to maintain an owned to loaned ratio between the number of physical books in hand and the number of digital copies lent. And so at the Internet Archive, we have acquired more than 2.8 million uh, physical, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we, have, we now have more than 2.6 million physical books in our collection and digitized versions of those online available to borrow through controlled digital lending. And it works very much like at your local public library. Um, if we have available copies to borrow, if there is uh, in that one-to-one own-to-loan ratio, if there is no uh, uh, if there is no wait list, if there's no one who's reading that book, you can check out the book. If, however, someone is reading that book, the one digital copy that's available, then you can't access it. And if we have additional available copies, you can join a wait list and you can learn. Uh, uh, you can uh, be notified when it's your turn to read. Again, just like at your local public library, but. Um, controls, uh, uh, controlled digital lending implies control. So I want to walk through what are some of the controls in controlled digital lending. So I first, I've talked about the owned to loaned ratio, and that's really an important uh, aspect of any controlled digital lending program. And again, if there are no available copies, then you can you know, wait for an available copy to come uh, available to read or join a wait list. Um, it's not a free for all. So um, books circulate for a limited time. It's just like checking out a book at your library. Um, you have to be a logged in user. You have to be a patron of the Internet Archives library. It's free. Um, you just need a, an email address and an Internet connection. And you can check out uh, anyone around the world can check out up to five books at a time. Anyone, uh, again, with a library card from the Internet Archive has access to that 2.6 million uh, book collection that we've made available. Uh, and again, there is limited circulation periods for uh, for the books. And uh, you, when you come to the end of your circulation period, you can check it out again or join the wait list. We also have digital rights management, DRM, uh, in the mix to protect the files. And so what uh, we use Adobe Digital Editions, which is the same system that uh, uh, publishers use on their sites uh, to protect their eBooks. And the, the reason for putting DRM in the mix is that that prevents copying or redistribution of any of the downloaded encrypted PDFs or encrypted uh, EPUBs um, that we make available through our lending experience. We have a, a variety of ways of reading books online, including like a streaming view, which is the default view. If anyone's ever looked at a book at the Internet Archive, including all of the materials that we make available that are open access, that don't need any kind of rights protection, um, like controlled digital lending, it's the same uh, a page turning interface that you've seen in, uh, similar in many uh, online uh, book digital libraries. So that's generally how controlled digital lending works, but I want to talk about how it works at the Internet Archive. And so, uh, as, again, as I've mentioned, the Internet Archive has a physical library. We've built a lending library of more than 2 million books, and, and actually we're growing that collection at 2,000 books a day. Um, this is Brewster Kale, who is the Internet Archive's founder and digital librarian, and he's sitting among a sample of some of the physical books from our collection, and he's sitting inside a storage container, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Now, we get our books uh, at the archive through purchase. We uh, buy books outright, and we also get them from donations. Um, and so today I want to talk about a, a significant donation that came to us from Marygrove College uh, in Detroit, Michigan, here in the States. And so uh, we worked with the Marygrove staff um, because the entire college closed. And so in 2019, the, the Board of Trustees made the decision of donating the entire contents of the library at Marygrove to the Internet Archive for preservation and digitization through our Open Libraries program. Um, they didn't want the, the, the collection, because it was an entire library, they didn't want it to be split up and sold. They wanted to 
it to stay together as an intellectual unit and to be made available for future generations of scholars. So again, they donated the materials to us. And here, what you're seeing here then are some of the packing exercises that we go through um, to box up the entire library and to ship it to our physical archive uh, in the United States for um, staging and storage before being sent for digitization. And so what you're seeing here is some of the results of that labor. And what you're seeing are books in boxes, boxes on pallets. Those pallets are shrink wrapped, double stacked, and then put into storage containers for transport. And they're also put into storage containers for um, storage after digitization. So after books are scanned, they return to our physical archive. And again, our physical books don't circulate. They're stored in this kind of a storage environment. And we, we know where we have a manifest uh, uh, and, and a collection system that lets us know where the physical book is in, in this storage matrix. And then our physical books um, are stored out of circulation. What does circulate is the digital copy that we make available through controlled digital lending. And again, uh, so we have, uh, oh, this was a, a screenshot from just a, a couple of uh, days ago. Um, uh, uh, we, we now have more than 2.6, not 2.3 million uh, books available. So those 70,000 books that were part of the Marigrove donation, they are now integrated into this collection and they're part of this lending collection that we make available um, to, to anyone online. Now, in addition to making the books available for borrowing, we've also at the Internet Archive gone a step further and woven those books into the web. It's one of the things you can do with once a book is digitized, once it's online, you can network it, you can make it available um, in interesting ways. And so we've the, the Internet Archive, we have uh, a long history uh, and relationship with the Wikimedia Foundation and with Wikipedia. And so we worked on a project that we call Turning All References Blue, which has gone through all, um, nine languages of Wikipedia and done a citation analysis and the, with the purpose of linking citations in Wikipedia to the references in the digitized books that are available through controlled digital lending. And so I'm showing, a, I'm going to walk through a, a little example here of, of, of how that works. And so again, um, we, we worked through nine languages of Wikipedia. We extracted all of the citations that are cited with an ISBN. It was a starting point. We understand ISBNs are just for modern materials, you know, 1960s and more recently, they're not unique. They're, they have international issues. Yes, agreed. Um, it's not exactly like the absolute best uh, number to use, but it was a number where we could start and where we could learn build confidence with the community about what we were doing, the Wikipedia community and the scholarly community, and then you know, uh, start tackling the more challenging issues uh, uh, in, in matching things without a known identifier. So uh, what I want to show uh, here, so uh, again, we, we went through all of Wikipedia, extracted out all of the citations um, with, let me go back a slide actually, um, extracted out all of the citations that were cited with a Wikipedia. And again, the purpose is to be able to go from looking at a citation in Wikipedia, you know, in context, then drop down into that citation and then follow that citation directly into the scanned page in the literature where that citation, where those, you know, facts that have been cited by Wikipedia editors occur. And so on the, the next slide, what I'll show is that citation. So what you're, if you can uh, read the, uh, what I'm showing here is the, it's not just a link just to the title page of the book. When a uh, Wikipedia editor cites a particular page, we can draw a link directly into that page. And so the, in this particular case, the, uh, a little historical knowledge about the origin of the word petticoat um, appears in a book uh, written by Ruth Turner Wilcox from 1970. Um, this is the London edition of a book called The Dictionary of Costume. And on page 267, the Wikipedia editor has said there's an assertion about this, uh, the, the historical origins of the, of the term petticoat. And so clicking on that link in Wikipedia will take users directly into the cited page in, uh, in the book. And so we'll, we can use the, like the little zoom uh, uh, icons here to zoom in and see greater detail on the page. And in fact, here is the, the entry for petticoat um, on page 267 of the book, Dictionary of Costume. 
So that's a, a, a cool uh, integration with Wikipedia and a way of making these materials even more useful um, online. And putting, again, putting our books at the places where people are wanting to access them, which is you know, working through citations. Now, um, what you're seeing here, this is controlled digital lending. Uh, so if I was, uh, if I wanted to, I'm, I'm, I'm showing here in the screenshot, I'm logged in at the Internet Archive. And I have the option of borrowing this book for one hour. Um, and if I, um, so, so you see, I've come in here on a, a link from a citation, which means I get access, a preview to the page that's cited and the page afterwards. But if I wanted to see pages on the other sides of the of that citation, I need to, to log in and to borrow the book. And in that way, then I, as a, as a researcher, as a user, can dive in, explore more if this particular book is of interest to me. So I'll, I want to talk briefly about the Open Libraries program and how it works. And it's uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a, this is a, a low barrier uh, way of participating in controlled digital lending. So we ask libraries to give us um, the your mark records, and so we will run an overlap analysis between your physical collection and our digital collection, and, and we'll use ISBNs, LCCNs, and uh, OCLC identifiers to make those matches between what you have on your shelves and in your collection and what we have on our digital shelves and in our digital collection. So we make that overlap and we provide it back to the libraries. Um, and then each library gets a collection page at the Internet Archive. They get a, uh, a and then data files that they can use to bring that information back into their catalog with all of those matches. And then we ask libraries to make a, an additional um, consideration with those matched titles. Would you be interested? Would you be willing to suppress the circulation for those books? and? and let the Internet Archive have an additional copy to lend through our controlled digital lending service. And that's how we scale is through our partnerships. And so we have more than 80 libraries that are participating in our open libraries program and more than 45 who are actively contributing uh, their collections into our lending counts um, that let us get above the, you know, in that owned to loan ratio. We have one copy that we've acquired and digitized. And um, in some cases we have it, we've acquired additional copies as well. But it's through the partnership is how we can get uh, uh, even more copies to, uh, to to lend. And importantly, this costs nothing. It's a non-commercial service, and so it costs nothing for libraries to participate, and it costs nothing for patrons to check out. Again, it's free for uh, borrowing. It's free for participating. Now, one of the central questions um, that comes up from all libraries who are considering this is, well, do we really have to limit circulation for books that are in CDL? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the the one of the main controls and controlled digital lending is that owned to load ratio. So um, talking a little bit about how to participate in the program, it's very simple. It's an online form, uh, easy enough to, to fill out and uh, and and complete. And we do have um, libraries that are in um, outside of the United States that are participating in our program. And one of those is um, uh, Mark Williams, the chief librarian for the Milton Public Library um, and in Ontario, Canada. And what uh, Mark is saying uh, is that the, you know, the, the content's great, patrons think it's good, the board thinks it's a great idea, they're on board with it philosophically, and just everyone thinks that this is an important service edition. So um, uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll wrap my uh, remarks there and uh, hold questions for the Q&A at the end. Thanks much. Thank you very much, Chris, and I certainly encourage, we'll make sure we put a couple of links into the chat around that, and I see the applause coming in, so thank you very much. As you said, let's go quickly on to Ben so that we can maximise the time to deal with the questions, to respond to the questions that are coming through in the chat. I can see it's really active, there's some really interesting discussions going on, but what I want to do now is ask Ben to take the floor and suggest some next steps and ideas. Thank you, Ben. Um, could someone put my uh, slides up, please? Or may yeah, here we go. Right. Um, so, just to clarify, uh, the title of my talk is "Does European Copyright Law Already Allow Controlled Digital Lending?" Um, and by European copyright law, I mean those countries which are um, regulated by 
the European Union's copyright key. So that includes not only EU countries, but also countries such as Norway, and also um, a certain country that's decided it wants to leave the European Union, indeed has left, and uh, that country's lower courts are still regulated by um, court decisions made in the European Court of Justice. So, so this isn't just an EU conversation. It actually has wider ramifications than that. Um, and those of you who have seen my presentation before will, will recognize parts of what I'm going to talk about. But essentially, libraries have, have existed for uh, millennia. And libraries, whether we're talking about HE libraries or public libraries or national libraries um, or private libraries really have three core functions. One is what's known in the profession as collection development and management, i.e. acquiring uh, collection items. So acquiring books, acquiring journals, records, films, etc., etc., building the collection. Then we have access, and that's obviously often about the end user, of the readers, Americans say the, 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 the library patron, um, but it also includes other libraries because not every library can buy every single uh, item, of course. So interlibrary loan, where one library lends to another library, is, is extremely important um, for, for, for libraries. And then third, some libraries undertake preservation. That didn't work, so let's try that button. Um, I'm a uh, member of the Libraries and Archives Copyright Alliance that Johanna referenced in the country that shall not be named that's left the European Union. And one of the questions was, well, what's copyright got to do with ebooks? And the answer to that is absolutely everything. Um, so if we look at those three core functions, first of all, um, the ability to acquire books is the result of what's called in copyright law, if it's an in-copyright book, um, that comes from what's called the exhaustion doctrine, which in the US is called um, the first sale doctrine. And essentially, what that means is once a book or a journal has been lawfully sold, then in the analog world, the author, the publisher, cannot control onward purchases. So that means that any library can buy any book. Uh, copyright creates a monopoly, what we call in copyright law an exclusive right. And I don't think this is the case in the US, but in Europe, um, that monopoly right um, is, is applies to lending. So one of the exclusive rights is the lending right. Um, and therefore, what copyright law does is it then creates an exception to the exclusive rights, which allows libraries to lend uh, its collection items. And then finally, preservation, again, is, is regulated, of course, by copyright law, if the works are in copyright. So um, Turning that uh, into sort of European copyright law um, and digital, we have multiple problems. So first of all, that the exhaustion of rights does not apply to ebooks because they are viewed as services in European law. So, um, so, so actually, libraries don't necessarily have 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 the right to buy any book that's available on the marketplace because they are licensed. Um, access and lending of that collection, well, that will depend on the license, and even preservation uh, until the implementation across the EU of the Digital Single Market Directive. Even preservation isn't guaranteed. It, it will depend on the license. Although, as I said, that is, uh, is, is changing. So essentially, when if you think about uh, the the advent of the World Wide Web, um, you know, in 1994, when it went global, the view was that it would herald in this amazing new dawn of, of inclusion and, and dig digital inclusion, so e equal access to, to knowledge online. And the reality of the matter is that, you know, 30 
25 years later, nearly 30 years later, particularly for education research and libraries, it's, it's actually created significant amounts of digital exclusion. Um, so we talked about preservation briefly there. So libraries haven't been allowed necessarily to digitize, um, sorry, to preserve digital items. Um, it w there's a, been a lot of discussion in Europe around text and data mining. Well, people have been able to data mine, analyze analog material for thousands of years with a, a pen and a paper. But you know, we've been excluded from doing that because of copyright law in the digital age. Um, and ebooks, again, is another example of, of di I think, extreme digital exclusion in certain instances. So, you know, people might say, well, just buy the paper. Well, if it isn't available in paper, you can't buy, just buy the paper. Also, I think there is an expectation now in public libraries and other libraries that that you know some people want to use ebooks, and obviously libraries have got to respond to reasonable patron expectations. What about people that can't visit physically the library? Um, it costs me something like sixty euros if I want to visit if I want to visit the British Library in London, our national library. You know. They have an ebook, but I have to spend 60 euro, euros, and that's not including lunch or the underground because I cycle. Um, so, you know, very expensive. What about cli climate emergency? So, I, you know, ebooks and paper books and are, 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 are in some cases the same and important ways different. Um, and, and Johanna has spoken about this, I think you know in 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 spades really that there is a huge imbalance of of power really you know libraries can't just decide not to buy books libraries have to buy books um and and over and above that often the, because of this imbalance of power the, the contractual terms are are, are 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 highly highly weighted to the interests of publishers and as far as i'm concerned most countries, maybe all countries, you know, there are certain protections in consumer law protecting these kind of imbalances of, of power, but they don't apply to institutions. And, you know, the fundamental point is that copyright law provides this, this, this monopoly. We've got a, a, here we go. So one solution is, is, is open access. Um, and of course, that, might be it feels like it's been going on forever and a day um and if you look at journal output for example only something like 25 percent of uk journal output is 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 um subject to gold open access terms and the uk journal output is something like 66 percent only of global journal articles so um there are you know uh, we have made hum tremendous progress with open access. It feels like we have many, 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 many more miles to travel. And again, I don't think open access is a realistic solution to the issues that public libraries face either. So I, I, I you know, I'm delighted at the launch of or, or the pre-launch, perhaps, of Knowledge Rights Twenty One, um, because the 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 organization i understand is going to be working on open access issues and copyright issues and i think for too long there's been sort of tunnel vision um op open access people and advocates do open access copyright advocates do copyright and they're seen as mutually exclusive in some sort of strange senses in 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 terms of the way that 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 people revolve around these issues. So I'm, I'm hoping that Knowledge Rights 21 can encourage people to join the dots. It's not an either or, we, we need copyright reform and we need open access. So Johanna has spoken in spades about um, HE libraries and university libraries, but the same issues run across national libraries and, and, and public libraries. So you see in 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 certainly in English language markets, a big difference between 
the cost of buying a paper book and the cost for a public library to buy um, a, a, an e-book. Um, we see bundling of, of titles as well, that you can't just buy one title. So Macmillan, for example, requires that you buy something like a thousand titles, according to uh, a study by Rebecca Giblin in in Australia. So so we we see bundling, we see refusal to license. So in certain countries uh, like the UK, for example, and Ireland, Hachette refuses to license ebooks to public libraries. Um, and and I suppose a an anecdotal issue as, as a researcher, um, bringing in national libraries. Um, when all the libraries were closed due to COVID, um, there were e-books sitting in the British Library under legal deposit, which, um, are, you know, because the library was physically closed, they couldn't lend even an e-book to 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 a reader like like me so so the issues are sometimes identical sometimes different but they affect public libraries university libraries and 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 national libraries also so i want so Johanna has spoken a, a lot about this. She also mentioned the great traction that the campaign has got in in a UK national newspaper like The Guardian, BBC also. Um, and I suppose, the, you know, the overarching question is, what, what does this all mean for the future of a library? We've been able to acquire do collection development using the the technical terminology we've been able to lend to other libraries to end users and we've been able to preserve and all this is being um, disrupted by the fact that uh, publishers have chosen in 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 the digital world to rely not on copyright law because copyright law allows all those activities but to rely on licenses um, there's, 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 you know, there's no reason for that. They lobbied very heavily in in the early 1990s, which resulted in uh, the world, um, the 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 WCT, the WIPO Copyright Treaty, which creates a new right of of publishing online, making available communication to the public in legalese. It also uh, put. Um, technical protection measures sort of above copyright exceptions and copyright flexibilities. So they lobbied hard to protect uh, published works and, and, and other sorts of works from piracy online. And then ironically have decided not to use copyright law. You know, they, they rely on licensing and the, the monopolies that are absolute monopolies that that are are enshrined in many licenses because there's a this imbalance in the relationship between a library that must buy and 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 the publisher that doesn't doesn't have to sell so you know i'm i'm personally very concerned about ebooks and what that actually means for the for the future of 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 libraries so I'm very interested in controlled digital lending. You know, it actually brings agency back to the library. So it allows collection development. It allows lending. It allows um, uh, uh, yeah, lending access between libraries as well as to end users. And it allows um, preservation because libraries are in control of the digital object. You know, it isn't just on a server belonging to a publisher. So I think CDL brings agency back and allows a library to be a library again, of course, sub subject to the law. It allows, uh, you know, a baseline, I think, for libraries and patrons so, so that, you know, they can act as libraries, they can lend, they can uh, loan. Um, it creates more reasonable, stable pricing, because if a library is able to purchase a paper book and then digitize it, we don't see these, um, you know, thousand percent more expensive for an ebook than a paper book. So it doesn't wreck library budgets. Obviously, if you have the right to, to, to digitize in law, then um, a publisher can't refuse to license. <laughs> 
Um, it can't, you know, bundling it, it isn't a thing. And in Europe, we have something called the public lending right fee, which, again, I think, yeah, you know, we would still apply to um, to, to digitize books that, that fall under controlled digital lending laws. So in the interests of time, so we actually have a European Court of Justice case on this where the Dutch Public Library Association um, in, in, in faced with new legislation, which basically um, the Dutch government was, was arguing that existing laws didn't allow libraries to um, to act, to buy any ebook available on the market and then lend them. So this went to the Dutch courts, and this then went to the European courts. And uh, the the Advocate General and actually the courts were, were very public interest oriented. And and you know if you look at this great quote, without wishing to overstate its importance, the present case undeniably offers the court a real opportunity to help libraries, not only to survive, but also to flourish in, in, in the digital world. And essentially, um, what the court decided was that we didn't need an update to the existing, what's called the Rental and Lending Directive, part of the copyright a key. It basically said, we have to interpret law in a proactive, positive fashion. It doesn't have to be updated every time te technology changes. So absolutely, libraries can um, acquire any ebook available on the market and then lend. And importantly, it sort of put in a one user, uh, one loan um, requirement, as as Chris has 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 shown. So essentially, if you buy one copy of an ebook, you can only lo loan one copy. If you buy two, you can loan two at the same time. Um, so that that in a in a nutshell was was this hugely significant case from the ECJ in in 2016, and you know it 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 fundamentally rejected licensing as being the model that that regulates um, regulates lending of ebooks by by libraries, and it. You know, it, it 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 one of the reasons it actually gave for that was that copyright law is good for authors because of the public lending right, the the money that goes every time a book is lent in a, in a public library, and of course what it does is it it creates a sort of a because you know that you can buy a book, you know that you can lend it, so it creates again this baseline for public libraries um, to operate in in the way that it. They have done for for you know two thousand years. So, from a copyright law perspective, there are two elements um, to to lending. So, an ebook. One is what we call reproduction in 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 the law. So, the reproduction right, and then the lending right. So, the court case was about ebooks. So it was talking about the library making reproductions of the ebook on its own servers. Um, so, so although the court case didn't actually specifically talk about digitization of paper books, it did say, you know, libraries have the right under existing European copyright law to make reproductions. And European copyright law doesn't you know, it just talks about reproductions, whether those are analog to analog reproductions, in this case, analog to digital or digital to digital. The law doesn't go into that level of specificity. It just allows reproduction. So even though the court case uh, focused on accessing digital ebooks that were being sold to consumers by libraries, it, it clearly... Um, took on board the need for, for libraries to make reproduction. So, so I would argue that we don't have a problem with the reproduction right, potentially, in terms of copyright law. And then it clearly what it did, what it did talk about is um, the right to lend. So you have an ebook and libraries can lend on a what's called an owned to loaned ratio. So 
buy one, lend one, buy two, you can lend two at the same time, which Chris is amazing and swish looking platform does very well, I think, um, through the use of technical protection measures, of course. So the question then becomes, so we have this principle in European copyright law, which is what the ECJ does, is it creates, uh, it, it, it rules on um, principles in European copyright law. It doesn't sort of look into the basics. So now we have to decide, we have to look at member state law to decide, well, actually, under that ECJ ruling, can we lend uh, e-books? So we now have to go down to the national level. And uh, the probably after um, the law of the country that should not be named, um, I'm most uh, familiar with Irish copyright law. And I apologize to Irish colleagues, the my my PowerPoint has the Irish trickler there. Um, and when it kind of came onto the system, it's just turned into IE. So imagine a lovely little green, um, white and orange flag there. So if you look at the specificities of Irish copyright law, it section 65 allows thinking about the reproduction rights, it does allow libraries to make replacement copies. So you've got a paper one and you can replace it. You can or you can add to it. So um so the reproduction right is covered off in Irish law for libraries. You can make an additional copy. I have a paper copy. I now want to make an additional digital copy. But then if you look at section 65.2, it says this section shall, not, shall only apply where it is not reasonably practical, bull, sorry, not reasonably practicable to purchase a copy of the work concerned for the purposes of subsection one, i.e. making a replacement copy. So, so perhaps you could interpret this to say, well, if Hachette is not licensing an ebook to me, it's not practicable for me to purchase a copy of that ebook because the license doesn't allow it. But we know that European copyright law allows libraries to lend, irrespective of what the license says. So I think in Ireland, you could say, well, under certain, and obviously this is about risk profile, and I don't know where that's, maybe that was on the previous slide, I should say. Um, yeah, this will all depend on how laws are crafted at the member state level. And it also depends on the library risk tolerance at this point in time, because there are no kind of CDL laws in, in European copyright law. So you have to look at what's there. So in Ireland, I think you could say, well, if, you know, if, 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 if my li library X has a reasonable risk tolerance, then actually I am allowed to make reproductions it, as long as it's not reasonably practicable to purchase a copy. I can't license it. They want me to buy a thousand books. I only want to buy one book. So, so I think you could say, well, actually, it wasn't reasonable in the following circumstances to, to purchase that title. And then it's very clear um, that libraries, I mean, this is quite interesting, and I'm no expert in Irish copyright law. The librarian or archivist of a library or archive prescribed by the minister for the purposes of lending shall be exempt from the payment of remuneration under section 41G, i.e. lending, and shall not infringe the copyright in a work by the lendings of the copy of that work. So I don't know what this means for the PLR. <laughs> <laughs> um, seems somewhat confusing, but it's very clear that libraries can lend in Ireland. So you can make a digital reproduction under certain circumstances, I think you could argue, and then you can lend as a, as a library. Um, and we've all overrun, so <laughs> I shall now um, hand it over to Stephen to sort of uh, maybe bring out some questions and, and, and that, that the audience has been um, asking. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for your patience and listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to all of the speakers. And to be honest, I haven't, <laughs> as moderator, I failed to do my job in trying to keep everyone's time simply because the content has been so rich. And I think just looking at the comments we've been seeing in the chat, some of the questions coming up, I think people are really 
I'm certainly getting a lot from this. I think everyone else is getting a lot from this. So we've still got six minutes left, so there's still time to actually ask your own questions. Um, among the questions that have come up already, a first one, which I think, Ben, you mentioned a little bit about, about trying to build those links between the open movement and the copyright movement. A few people have talked about whether there are lessons to learn or whether, I know, what cooperation between the open movement, the open access movement, the open educational resources movement, and the movement for changes to copyright law or recognition of changes to copyright law in order to allow for controlled digital lending might look like. I think a question that certainly sort of struck me in this is that, and this comes very much from what Johanna was saying about libraries don't necessarily really know what's going on. I don't know, we don't have all the data, often for transparency reasons it's not possible to share, but it would be interesting to hear from all of you how much a sense you have of whether publishers understand what's going on, whether they really understand the impact of what libraries are doing and whether they're really working on the basis of full information about what's happening, or is it simply a fear that whenever a library has access, it costs them sales? So I might start with those two, um, and then please answer these, whichever of these you want to, in whichever way you want to. And if you keep it your answers to less than a minute, ideally, then we may also be able to take more questions from the audience. So, Johanna, was there anything you wanted to add on those? I think um, in terms of publishers and do they know what they're doing, I think it, I think the danger is linking, um, is putting all publishers into one kind of basket. I think the big publishers, absolutely, they do know what they're doing and their whole business is profiteering, whereas there are um, a lot of smaller publishers who don't and I've I've experienced that when I was in when I did a presentation at the um, independent publishers guild and a lot of the small publishers have no idea how to get their books into academic libraries or how to get them um, into other libraries or, uh, and they were completely oblivious to the pricing and the licensing um, because they don't have the clout that the other pu that the big publishers have, and there was a lot of interest expressed in um, joining with us and and helping um, them to get into the market because they wanted to get their books out there. But a lot of them didn't want to exploit, or you know, their sole purpose wasn't about profiteering. It was about sharing information at fair prices. So I think. Yeah, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, and I think we need to work closely with those smaller publishers and see if, if because, I mean, they are our alternatives um, to the big publishers. And a minute, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Chris? Sure. So um, it is common knowledge that the Internet Archive is being sued by four large uh, commercial publishers. And we also have great relationships with uh, a variety of publishers across the publishing spectrum, both commercial publishers, independent publishers, academic publishers. The, the, the model of controlled digital lending is um, it's, it's not something that the Internet Archive alone is doing. There are hundreds of libraries that are participating that are doing controlled digital lending. And so um, I, I think that the that think that the the landscape is changing. Uh, it, it is shifting. I think that people are understanding. Uh, I think uh, the the work that everyone is doing here in talking about these issues is raising awareness around the the challenges, both in the for libraries, for patrons, for scholars of uh, uh, everywhere in accessing content. And that's really what I think we're all really wanting to be focused on: is how do we uh, bring down these barriers? How do we make information available to to scholars anywhere and everywhere that they are that they're working. I hope that would be the focus. Thank you. Excellent. And over to you, Ben. Um, just two, two, two points. Uh, one is uh, universities, funders, research councils are funding an awful lot of open access work. And the exact opposite is there's practically no funding of copyright work. Um, 
and again, I, I think librarians should should think about that and 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 push on on that issue because, as I said, it's not either or; it's definitely both. And yet, the funding is is hugely hugely skewed towards open access, with virtually nothing going to support the interests of libraries from copyright law perspective. Do publishers know what they're doing? Again, I think at a policy level, I think they do. The, the, what they are doing is they're investing in protecting their own interests. I think as Johanna has said, in Ireland, I think there's been amazing leadership from colleagues like Cahal um, to, 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 to protect the interests of libraries. Um, and it, it, unfortunately, there are a few exceptions like Paul Aris, who's uh, the the library director at, at UCL, and um, I think he's he's vice provost for research. You know, he's 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 supported um, work on e-books a lot, um, but and Silip has has been very very helpful. But unfortunately, we don't see this sort of library association uh top down kind of focus on this issue in the uk as 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 we do in ireland so i think um you know from those of of you in other countries it would be great to see library associations really start to to address the many many problems that we face in the context of ebooks Thank you very much. And I guess hopefully with people from 51 countries here, at least some of you, please do get in touch. Um, I think the, the emails of the presenters are available. Um, get in touch with, with the, the Libra colleagues who've organized this webinar in order to share your ideas. We'll certainly be looking through the chat in great depth because there have been some really interesting examples mentioned there. Um, given that we're already over time, I suggest therefore that we close now. I wanted once again to thank Johanna, Chris, Ben, not just for your presentations today, but for all the work you do in general in order to support access to information, in order to try and change laws, change practices, in order to help libraries continue to deliver on their missions in the digital age. With that, thank you to everyone. Uh, the recording will be available shortly and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Can Johanna, Chris and Athena and yourself, Stephen, stay on? Yes.